Hello and welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, episode 9. Today we're talking to DSLR video shooters, Caleb Pike. So, get ready for some magic. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today on the Indie Film Academy podcast. I'm Jason Buff, your host and... Master of Ceremonies. Um, so we're, we're talking today with Caleb Pike, and Caleb is one of these guys who is well known on the internet for his website, DSLR Video Shooter. And basically what he does is talk a lot about cameras and lenses and equipment, audio, whatever, and, and just does these great reviews and kind of educates people on how all the gear work. This episode is basically where we geek out and just talk about all of the, the fun stuff out there, all the different tools that are available for filmmakers. And, you know, you know, spoiler alert, we basically settle on the fact that the GH4 is the camera to get now. Don't forget, as always, please subscribe to the podcast if you enjoy what you're hearing leave us a review if you have the time if you don't it's okay i know you're busy and go to indiefilmacademy.com we're constantly updating with interviews uh, from filmmakers and about gear and you know maybe a movie review here and there but just trying to fill it with good content for people who love filmmaking and who love film now let's go to my podcast episode <laughs> my episode with caleb bike here we go I want to find out, first of all, if you can, for people who don't know who you are and who don't know about your blog and DSLR, uh, DSLR Video Shooter, if you could talk about how that came about and a little bit of the history behind your um, behind DSLRVideoShooter.com. Sure, sure. Um, oh, man, it's a crazy story. It Like a lot of people online, I feel like it was all a mistake <laughs> or an accident. <laughs> it wasn't something that we set out, you know what, someday I'm going to run this site and do all these things. Um, but I I always had kind of an in and out love affair with video. And it started way back in middle school. And uh, once I got to college years, I uh, wanted to go to film school, but I wasn't ready to plop or, you know, take out a loan for Columbia College here in Chicago. Right. So um, I just decided to do um, to start doing uh, gen ed at a community college and hated every minute of it except for my economics class, which was amazing. But everything else, just the whole college vibe. I mean, no offense to people that go to college, but I just hate that <laughs> lifestyle. I, right. you know, college kids make me crazy. Most of them I'm generalizing here, of course. Um, right. okay. And film students are awesome. But in general, just the whole <laughs> Let's just blow all this money. We're never going to use it unless you're a lawyer, a doctor, or you know, a scientist. So um, I just decided I just quit. I did one semester. I committed to that, and then decided to quit. And I, I'm a big fan of quitting if if you see it's not working <laughs> out because people get so silly. Like they'll 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 bleed through this terrible book when they could have quit after the first chapter. Like right. there's nothing wrong with that. So. Um, or at least I hope not, because that's that's how I roll. So I decided to stop that, and then uh, wanted to pursue video and blogging. I had done a lot of web stuff, uh, a lot of web design and, and development with WordPress and whatnot. So um, I just bought some cinematography books, started messing around with lighting, and I one day in my grandfather's basement, I was living with him at the time. Um, I was just lighting some stuff and decided just to record myself to kind of experiment with like interview setting and, and lighting interviews and put that up on Vimeo. And a lot of people started asking up questions, asking for more information or more videos like that. So having the WordPress web background, I threw up a blog previously in high school. I'd run a, like a Mac. Uh, it was like the custom Mac, I think. And it was, uh, you know, how to customize your your Mac and OS and all that stuff. So I had a little experience with blogging. So I threw the site up just for kicks, never expected it to do anything. And then it just kept growing and growing. And, um, now it's a full-time gig pretty much. <laughs> so, so that's right. the, the whole, how I got into that and, uh, and shooting on the side. Um, I spent a lot of time shooting with uh, a couple of directors in the area. And, um, that was great cause I, I was able to really, cut my teeth on a lot of production stuff and still do a lot of um, production, but uh, it's, it's intermixed with uh, running DSLR video shooter. Right. Now, do you, you do a lot of reviews. Are those, do you get sent products and things to review or do you just like rent them or how does that work? Yeah. When I started out, it was just me and whatever I could afford to purchase. Um, 
and uh, would just talk about that, do a lot of tutorials, and then over time, uh, being or I started using Amazon affiliate stuff. So mm-hmm. um, that helped create some revenue, so I could actually start to build up a kit because I I had a 7D, a Canon 7D. I stole my dad's 50 millimeter lens and I had a cheap tripod, and that was it. So um, so doing building a little bit of revenue there, shooting a little bit, and then uh, after a little while, B&H Photo Video up in New York. Um, approached me and uh, they have an affiliate program and uh, what, the, what the way they work is uh, you can request gear to review and they'll send you out loaner gear and then you have 30 days with it so so that really helped you know uh, you know rocket launch me into um, working with a lot outside of what I could afford and try new things try new cameras without buying or renting and spending a fortune on renting all this stuff so so they're really great, and um, and that's that's been an awesome relationship to uh, to work with them. And what I love about them is and a big thing for me is uh, unbiased reviews. Obviously, that's what everyone wants to wants to see. So, um, well, I've been accused of going one way or the other. So you know, people call me a Canon whore, and then when I <laughs> when I bashed Canon, was jumping out and sold everything and bought GH4s. Now as a Panasonic whore. So, you know, it is what it is. But B&H is awesome because they're a store and they just sell everything. So um, they're fine with me tearing a camera to pieces because it's terrible. And so uh, so that's very exciting to not have to deal with all the politics with trying to reach out to a camera manufacturer. So, Right. Have you ever run into any trouble with people getting angry at a negative review? Oh, they well, my thing is, um, I did one really negative one on the Sony A77 when it first came out, All right. and uh, you know there were a bunch of Sony exclusive sites that put it up, and it just it got really ugly, and you just gotta <laughs> you know it is what it is, and and my thing now, and I've always kind of been like this, I was expecting it to be a great camera, and I had a review because I had it for 30 days, so that's where the negative review came out, but. Um, I don't really spend a lot of time bashing stuff. I pretty right. much do a lot of research and figure out what I would personally as a shooter need or do need um, and then find the best quality and budget options and then do reviews on them. So you won't really find a bunch of negative reviews. I find things that I don't like about certain pieces of equipment, but right. um, I, I really just try to just be positive. And, you know, we don't, who wants to waste a time going through YouTube, trying to find one review that has something positive to share or has something good that they found. So I don't want, you know, out of several hundred videos for there only to be a handful that are actually helping people. So, Right. So you started in 2010, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So it's... so the, the DSLR revolution had kind of already happened when you when you started <clears throat> reviewing cameras. Well, actually, it was it was starting to actually kick up um, the 5D. Right. I, I started roughly when the 7D came out, whenever that is. Um, so the 5D Mark II had already been out, um, but it was still such a young thing, you know, whereas now it's totally normal to see people running around shooting video on DSLRs and, yeah. and the the layman gets it, you know. So you'll right. be doing an interview or going somewhere and you'll see someone with a DSLR and someone else or a client will be like, oh, they, they'll shoot video. Yeah, I totally get it. So at the time, there really Canon was the only option. Nikon had a few subpar options and uh, there's obviously the GH1, which had serious issues. So um, there was still uh, a lot of room for information and finding tools to make these things work. And of course now it's outrageous, you know, Panasonic, or excuse me, yeah, Panasonic with the AF100 kind of sparked that whole large sensor camcorder thing. So now that's a huge um, industry as well. Everybody's working on something there. And uh, so now it's, even though the name is DSLR Video Shooter, it's kind of moved into just large sensor and, um, you know, serving filmmakers in general. Right. Now, how did you educate yourself on, I mean, you've obviously become somewhat of an authority on, on these cameras now. How did you learn all the things that you know about, you know, sensors and, and you know, all the different aspects of shooting on a DSLR? Yeah, um, I, I've kind of always, I kind of got this from my dad. He uh, is a master researcher. So, <laughs> you know, he everyone has their hobbies and he... Uh, really would always dig into stuff. And he actually, he's the one who introduced me to Philip Bloom way back when Philip had just started his website. So mm-hmm. I don't know what 
at what point in my life this was, but it's pretty early on when I was just tinkering with video. So he's always um, been awesome with, uh, and he gets interested in what other people are interested in. He'll do research. So he he taught me how to use Google way back. He taught me um, how to research things and um, an art that I've really come to appreciate, which is just learning to learn. So if you right. if you can master that, there's nothing you can't do that you set your mind to. So um, so that's something that I always always appreciated uh, him instilling. And so when it came to these cameras, and I'll admit it, I had no idea what to do with this DSLR when I first bought it. I was mainly in it for the depth of field, the shallow depth of field, like most people. Right. Um, and I remember playing with them like, wow, there's like three ways to adjust exposure and they all do funky stuff. So I had no idea <laughs> what the relationship between shutter speed, aperture and all that stuff was. So it's just digging in. Um, the, the one book that really helped a ton was I'm trying to remember the exact title, but um, cinematography, the art of or the art of cinematography. Um, I can hunt it down. It's on my website somewhere, but uh it's a great book, and it just has a, a massive overview on um, uh, cinematography and all the a lot of technical, but a lot of framing, and so that helped a lot to kind of jumpstart me. And then shooting, um, I wasn't supposed to be in the position I was. What happened was I was helping some small film uh, directors do stuff, and um, they were using these 720p broadcast cameras because that's what they could get their hands on. And so one day I showed up on set with my new 7D and just kind of shot on the side, showed it to the director, and I went from like barely a grip assistant to camera operator. And so that just <laughs> that just forced me to get my stuff together and really you know figure right. out what to do. And um, so so that's kind of how how a lot of that came together. Just a lot of experimentation and uh, just trying to trying to figure all this stuff out so I could actually. <laughs> produce right now you you said you started with the uh the 50 millimeter uh, sure was that like a 1.8 like the the nifty 50 one that everybody used? it was actually the 1.4 um oh, okay. so so that was nice and uh it's it's not the greatest lens it has a horrible focus ring i mean it's if anyone's ever used it they know that um when you when you try to focus there's like this grinding sensation almost um it's weird it's not the not the motors you're not fighting the motors but right. uh it's it's not not a great lens for for video necessarily okay now um when you what now when you first started technology has obviously changed tremendously since 2000 in such a short period of time can you describe what you think are the most significant changes with dslrs over the past five years or four years? Yeah. Um, let's see. None of them came from Canon, except for early on, unfortunately. <laughs> Ever since they did the 5D Mark III or II, um, they've been slow to really push the envelope. And it makes sense. You know, there's so much polit politics. And I, I'll get back to your question, but just one thing that's made me kind of sad recently is Black Magic. Um, they have the opportunity to, like, rage against the machine and beat the man right so they didn't have any camera department so canon they've had been doing video for forever so when they came out these dslrs and then they came out with the their cinema line of cameras the c100 through 500 um they, they have to be careful so that um people just don't go out and buy a pimped out 5d mark 5 or whatever so um black magic could have done anything so i would have loved to see them come out with something great and and had everything right so it had right. every feature that all these other manufacturers uh are tiptoeing around and what's funny is each manufacturer has a strong suit and they have one thing they do really well um uh, but then the other ones don't have it so you can't get that all-in-one camera unless you spend fifty thousand dollars and get a red epic or something um so so that was always kind of painful and uh, so I think the biggest leaps um, was going from, you know, the Canon DSLRs, moving up to the first one is just audio. Having the, the Canon DSLRs that had audio built in where you could record manually. So we all had auto gain control at one point. So that was that was pretty exciting. Um, it was still terrible. You couldn't really monitor anything, <laughs> but you could at least, you know, 
jerry rig it and get audio in camera and you didn't have to do dual system sound if push came to shove um, and then it just kind of the other cameras took over uh, and other manufacturers nikon did some great um, uh, had a lot more dynamic range in their cameras obviously the whole black magic thing was crazy um, they had the worst form factor ever but they they offered a lot of new things we had the first more than 1080p camera um, and more recently, you know, oh, and then obviously Panasonic doing the AF100, which I think was a complete flop. I think it was a cool camera for a couple months before everyone else came out with something, but it just was a pretty, pretty poor camera, terrible at low light, kind of bulky, but it, it opened the door for Sony and Canon and, uh, other companies to start doing these large sensor cameras where we could actually have everything in one and not have to build this monstrosity of a rig around a DSLR. And I love that um, these other companies like Sony and Panasonic had a bunch of um, assist features, so peaking, uh, zebras, false color, all that good stuff, which Canon is, is still not um, producing with their cameras. So, so all that stuff was kind of a slow, just little things here and there, and... Um, now it's, and I, it's funny because I left Canon on the DSLR front. Um, I, I switched over to GH4s, but I just bought a C100. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I've always really respected those cameras. And uh, it's crazy to think that, what is it, five to, to eight years ago is when this whole thing started? Six mm -hmm. to eight years ago. And now we have, you can get one used for $3,500. You know, the battery lasts for a day or two. We have built-in ND, so no more silly, you know, ND filters. Um, great low light, and the form factor is fantastic. It's, it's we've come a long, long way. All right, now you just touched about a, uh, on about 20 different things that I want to go into more detail about. So let me let me go back a little bit. For people who are just starting out in filmmaking, can you give a, a little bit of an idea of how the different cameras compare, like? Right where we are right now in terms of what DSLRs are kind of the, and I know you've heard this a million times, but which are the ones that you really stand behind and why is it that people maybe shouldn't think about the Canon 5D Mark III as much as the GH4? Sure. Maybe? Can you just kind of compare them and what specifically you didn't like about the the black magic the the cinema camera and yeah you know I've seen some of your views reviews for the pocket camera and some other things that weren't all that glowing, and also the, the Sony A7S, so, so people sure. just have a, an idea. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I kind of made a mess of that, that last stream of thought. <laughs> just good. grab it, hold multiple times. Um, right, so right now as things stand, um, I'm not a huge fan of Canon's current offerings. I think for the money, um, there's some better options out there. So right now, the, the three kind of big hitters are... The Canon 5D Mark III, that's an incredibly popular camera. And if you have a whole set of Canon lenses, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? You can jump in. And if you're going to be shooting stills, that's a, it's an animal. That's what it's built for. So um, that's a good camera. It's, it's not revolutionary. And I'm not saying we have to shoot our revolutionary. But when you compare it to something like a Sony a7S and a GH4, which are kind of the other two big hitters right now, it's pretty sad what they have to offer so so there's the 5d mark three it's full frame killer camera as in and of itself it's it's a great camera um it's trusted people use it everywhere the a7s i think is a fantastic substitute um, because it offers just a ton the low light is outrageous on that if you haven't played with it you owe it to yourself to rent it for a project sometime um so it's also full frame and uh, the low light is incredible. You have Sony S-Log um, and a bunch of other features that the can Canon cameras don't have. And you can shoot 4K with an external recorder, which is pretty cool. Um, that's around, uh, it's also becoming a blur, but it's around the same cost as a 5D Mark III. Then you have the GH4, which is half the price of those cameras, shoots 4K internally, can do 4K 10, and it records 10-bit uh, to an external recorder, which none of the other cameras do right now. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure you have to look at a C100, or I'm sorry, C300, or even the C500 to get 10-bit. 
I want to say it's a C500. So for 1600 bucks, that's pretty outrageous that you can do 10 bit. Um, and the 4K, the slow motion. So at Canon 5D like video quality, you can be recording 96 frames per second in camera on the GH4. Um, it's just a great camera. There's just so many features and tools. And I'm working on a, a guide right now because they, they've, they've, they've let us change everything on the camera, which is a good and a bad thing. So I'm trying to walk through and show people, you know, what not to touch, what to touch, and then uh, just tips on really turning that into a, a powerful tool uh, for filmmaking. And it is a great camera. So that's what I switched to. Previously, I was on a 5D and a 6D from Canon. Right. Um, so that's kind of the big three hitters right now. I always love to throw this next camera in because it's it's right now one of the best, cheapest, cheapest. So if you're barely getting by paying rent, you know, you, there's no <laughs> way you can pull off, you know, some of these cameras. So the right. EOS uh, M from Canon is probably the cheapest uh, starter camera right now. And it's a tiny little mirrorless camera, similar sensor and setup to something like a T5i or one of the Rebel cameras from Canon. Right. But I think you can pick one up for like 245 or 250 something on Amazon. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's outrageous. So that's a good place to start. I had one of those for a long time. Um, that's kind of where it stands. And then there's the C100, um, and the C100 Mark II. Those, um, I'm more interested in because of the price cut, um, and the, uh, or at least the old, the old version, the Mark I. Um, and you can pick one up, use, you know, I got one for around 30, I think it's 3,500 and it came with two batteries you know, Canon batteries and you can find deals like that on eBay with, with low hours. And, um, I've always loved those cameras. My problem is I've always really needed two of the same camera to do what I do. Nice. Um, but, uh, I'm working with some people that also have C100. So I finally pulled the trigger and am loving it. It's, uh, just the lack of stuff you need, <laughs> you know, you, right. you, you could do everything. The audio quality is incredible with nothing added. Um, and just the built-in NDs, that's a lifesaver. It's just it's just a great camera. So Now explain that to me. The the built-in uh, neutral density, is that like you know, I have I'm primarily from more of a um, DSLR background, so sure. you know, I've I've got like a variable right. neutral density filter on my lenses, but is that how does that work? I mean, is that just something that's in front of the um, the sensor? Yeah, there's a little rotator. It's mechanical. So there's a little dial on the side of the camera, on the left side, lower down. And you have okay. three or four settings. No ND, and then two ND, I want to say four and six, or six and eight or 12. I can't remember right now. But um, yeah, you just spin the dial. And if you're watching the screen, you'll see this little, this little tray flop in front of the sensor. And then you have ND. So... Uh, it's great because you're not adding it to the front of your camera. And one thing about those variable NDs that I didn't know until the last year or two is the uh, I always struggled with, I would shoot with them, and one shot would just be dynamite, right? So it looks beautiful. And then the next shot, just something happened to the color, and it just didn't look right. And the reason for that is um, really those variable NDs are just two polarizers working against right. each other. So what happens is, you know, polarizers affect uh, reflections. So if you're shooting somebody and you keep changing that variable ND, you're changing the way light is reflecting off of their skin. So one shot will look great. Skin tones are fantastic. The next shot, it looks kind of muddy or green or gray. And that's the polarizer sucking reflections out of skin, which is natural. There should be some reflection in skin. Right. So, um, so that's another beautiful thing about the uh, built-in ND is it's not a variable ND; it's actual individual little ND filters. So they're fixed. They're, there's no polarizing involved. Um, so that's one of the massive features with that camera. You can go out, you can shoot indoors, walk outside, flip on your ND, and you're good to go. Or if you're indoors, one thing we like to do is um, if you are shooting slow motion or not slow motion on that camera, but um, if you need to um, play with your aperture and ISO settings for whatever reason or effect you want, you just slap ND on it, and uh, it, it's just fantastic. 
Now, how does the C100, you know, give me a, a an idea of how that compares to something like the A7S? You know, wh when would you want to bump it up to the C100? I mean, is, and and how does the C100 also compare to the it's the C500 that's the step up from that, right? Sure. Or am I, and then you know, talking sorry, <laughs> talking about that, and then comparing that to the really high-end stuff like the Dragon, the Red Dragon, or the Airy Alexa, or, or those guys. Where how does everything kind of like what what are you what really makes the huge difference in the price and, and what you're getting? Um, there's a bunch of features, and different manufacturers have different levels of these. Um, but you're looking at codec, frame rates, resolution, and uh, kind of workflow, as well as the individual cameras and manufacturers how they deal with dynamic range and skin tones. So um, something like an Epic, right? You have great dynamic range, killer dynamic range, good sensors. Um, you can do crazy frame rates and uh, have a lot of flexibility with resolution. And then you have something on the low end, like a, a GH4, has good resolution, decent frame rates, but you lose resolution. But then the dynamic range is not so great, and the sensor, when it comes to sensitivity, is pretty poor. So um, when you think about all this stuff, beyond kind of a C100, I wouldn't consider owning a camera, uh, unless I was doing an ungodly amount of work. So to me, owning an, you know, an Arri Alexa or uh, an, a Red Epic is mainly for rental houses or people who, you know, huge deal cinematographers that want to have their small kit for various reasons. Right. Um, otherwise, it just makes more sense to rent, in my opinion. Um, but th that's where the, the Canon Cinema Series and now the Sony FS7 are great cameras because they can be really solid workhorses and they're you know under 10,000 and the, the C100 is by a good deal. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but those those are oh the the reason to go to something like a C100 is to me it's really about budget. So when it first came out, you know I couldn't plop down six grand for a camera, much less two cameras. So that's where the DSLR thing has always been a fantastic budget option, and it's very right. they're very minimal. So if you want to you know get into a kind of a gnarly situation with the camera, you can grab one of those and and not worry as much and be pretty inconspicuous. So the C100, um, the form factor is fantastic. It's it's similar to DSLR, and a lot of us are used to that, and we like that. Some of us. Um, so so you're it's similar, but it's just so much better. The the grip unit that comes with it, you know, you can detach it and put it on handles for a rig. So that's something a lot of people don't think about when they get a rig for their DSLR. So they're like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. rigs are the stuff. You know, I can run around with this thing, and then they realize they can't control the camera at all or they have to get some wild follow focus system and even then they can't you know stop and start and change settings easily you have to reach back and play with the camera so the C100 fixes that and, it, and so it's, you can do things sorry go ahead oh go ahead well the thing that's always been interesting to me is can you record your audio directly into the C100 and have like high quality audio oh yeah it's killer um, i'm shooting sections of this GH4 where i have this GH4 guide where i have two cam both my cameras in front of me um, so I have to use a third camera to record it and I'm using the C100. Normally I use a juice link preamp with my GH4s, which is outrageously good. But with the C100, you just attach the handle with the XLRs and I just run my shotgun microphone right to the camera and it, it sounds amazing. So, um, that's what you're paying for when you're buying these cameras. They're more expensive, but you literally need nothing but a battery and a lens and a card. Right. That's it. So audio is pristine. Um, you know, you can adjust levels easily. There's a ton of great settings in there. Um, the low light's fantastic. And uh, you don't need a map box, really. Uh, I use a little shade just when I need to kind of block some light from a certain angle. But uh, no more NDs. You know, it's just a killer, killer camera. Now, um, when you talk about... Sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, there you're for good. A second. <laughs> um, now, when when you're talking about recording audio, because you know, 
a lot of people are going to be shooting films and they want to have a sound recorder on set with them. Does this in some ways eliminate the absolute need to have a recordist there with you, do you think? Um, we always like to have somebody dedicated to audio. So okay. it depends on the budget, obviously, but um, it is... I can't... But is the quality the same as you know recording into, let's say, for example, like a Zoom or something like that? Yeah, it really depends on the mic. Um, and I encourage people to check. I did a video comparing... A bunch of different solutions to that juice link preamp and okay. uh, really it comes down to quality of the preamp so um, when you plug a microphone into a recording device whether that be a zoom recorder or a camera the quality of your audio is mainly due to the preamps how good the preamps are in that recording device and your goal is to have a really like loud juicy signal hot signal going into that device so you can keep that input level low. So as you've, as most of us have experienced, when you jack up the input level on a, like an H4N, it gets really noisy because the, the, the preamp is having to really work and push up that level, which gets really hissy and noisy and nasty. So if you have a source that's just really juicy and hot, you can keep that super low, if not, you know, only at one which means that the preamps aren't doing almost any work and your noise floor is, just disappears. So when someone stops talking, it's silence. You're not hearing hiss or fuss or uh, any of that. So the um, DSL, pretty much every DSLR has terrible preamps. Um, so with the GH4, I've been using the Juice Link, which is one of the most powerful preamps out there and one of the cheapest, which is wild. Um, so you hook up your microphone to the Juice Link you use the juice link dial to turn up your audio levels. And then from the juice link, you send a line to your camera. And with the juice link on any camera, I've been able to drop the uh, the levels all the way down to zero or to plus one if you're on a Canon DSLR. So the first tick above zero to get mm-hmm. some sound. And um, the juice link is not even halfway. Like it's it's incredible on the dials. And uh, that gives you a great signal. So on the C100, you actually have good preamps. So you don't need any of that stuff. You just plug your XLR into the camera, and you're able to get fantastic sound. So uh, so that's that's what you have to think about with all these. Some, some recorders are better than others. But I'm finding, and I've been working with uh, um, a director out in uh, Rockford, Illinois, Corbin Tyson. And uh, he has a great sound guy, Jared, that we've been working with. And almost everything we do, we, we bring in a, a preamp with us. Right. So these recorders aren't the greatest um, with their preamps and the way you adjust audio. It's, it's usually buttons or step audio sometimes. So it's nice to have a really high-quality preamp. Um, so I don't know if that, that answers your question. But, yeah, that and yeah, yeah, having somebody to, to just that's all they do is audio. It's so freeing and just the security of knowing that you have a professional or at least somebody who knows audio to to deal with that so they're the one who's going to say oh they're a fan kicked on so that you don't have to deal with that later right no i mean the thing that i i'm curious about that that you've answered but let, let me just try to understand when you know when we're recording a scene for for a film for like a um you know a feature or a short or whatever you know, it's it's usual to have your sound recordist there. He's got his mixer. He's got, you know, his boom um, shotgun mic and maybe some lavalier mics. My question is, when you're shooting with like a C100, is all of his stuff going through his gear and then over into the camera? Uh, yes, ideally that's what you want to do. Um, okay. You could bypass that. So if you want to stay real minimal, you could just have him rock a boom and then uh, you're tearing around with the C100 and adjusting, you know, audio as you need to. Um, but ideally, you always want to um, send things over to him. The first thing the microphone hits is that preamp. It's getting a nice hot signal, which goes over to his recorder. And then um, from the recorder, you can send a line, or from the preamp, you can send a line over to camera. So that, uh, for whatever reason, if one fails, you've got the other. Um, okay. So that's usually how we roll is we each separately set up our levels and then, uh, you know, if, if the camera audio is great, then you're set because you can just go straight to edit. 
but if there's something wrong with the audio or the audio quality is much better on the recorder, you can use that. So it just gives you a lot of backup and security. Do you use something like Pluralize or anything like that to sync stuff up? I'm actually have fallen deeply in love with Final Cut 10. And okay. um, I'm a Final Cut 7 guy originally. And I, I just pushed that NLE until it literally broke or Apple broke it. <laughs> and then I finally just sighed and had to figure out what I was going to do next. I was looking at Premiere because it's very similar. It's, it's still that kind of old school standard layout with a NLE. But I decided to, to give Apple a shot and uh, did their 30-day trial. And after the last several updates, it's it's an animal. So I use uh, um, multicam. So you select several clips. Okay. You right-click. You say create multicam. You can set it up. So um, sometimes I'll go in if I have a really complicated multicam and uh, just tell it which camera is which. But what's great is you can just use one audio track and one video track. So you don't have to use multiple cameras. So that's a great solution um, to link up audio. And it, it's when you set it to automatic, it pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time figures it out. So I don't, you know, you don't need pluralize or any of this other stuff. And uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility with uh, using f fake camera angles. So if you're using 4K, um, often what I'll do is I'll just use my audio or just take a single video clip, right, from my GH4 at 4K. And I'll, I'll just right click that one uh, video file and say create multicam clip. And then in the multicam click editor, you can duplicate the video track. And then the second video track or the copy that I made, I uh, um, zoom that up or blow it up. So I have a, mm -hmm. a tight shot. And then you dump that uh, multicam, which is just looks like one single track. Okay, so it, it takes all this video files and dumps it into one track. You dump that into your timeline, and then they have the multicam editor. So as you're playing back live, you can change uh, angles. Okay. So I know that sounds really complicated when you're talking only in <laughs> audio, um, but it's incredible because it, it turned my editing time for my show. So if I did a five-minute video might take uh, 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how much B-roll I have. Now it's like four minutes and I'm out. So it's it's a super powerful tool. If you're doing documentary, it's a must. So uh, definitely recommend people check that out if, if they're dealing with lots of different audio and video sources. Now you, you were talking about 4K there. Can we talk about... Um... 4K and 2K and 1080p and all that stuff real quick sure. so people have an idea of what, uh, you know, the standard is. You know, the thing that kind of blew me away is how everybody for a little while was talking about uh, 2K, like it was mind-blowing that the um, the black magic was coming out with that. And then it seemed like only a year later, everything is like, oh, if it's not 4K, then it's, you know, forget about it. And I, I even thought 4K was just kind of ridiculous you know, because yeah. it was so so big but i mean what what is really going on with that you know what what is 2k i thought was pretty much the equivalent of 35 millimeter film right 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 um 2k was kind of getting the digital world to catch up with um more of a standard cinema uh resolution so the 4k thing i mean i love it now um I don't think any of us are using it how it was originally intended. The idea was you capture 4K and distribute 4K. That's mm -hmm. just ridiculous. Like that's gonna be <laughs> that's gonna take a while. Because um, really, <laughs> broadcasting still at 720. To my understanding, um, a lot of people don't know this, but dur current regulations you have to broadcast at uh, 720p. If you're doing progressive, it's only 720p. So when like HD television it's still 720p so we have these 1080p <laughs> tvs but right. we're watching 720p when we're watching cable or whatever it is um so we're not going to be anywhere near distributing 4k in a while right so even though we have 4k tvs right now they're still catching up to 1080 on uh distribution and you know blu-ray right now is 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 you know 1080 so so to me 4k is almost exclusively a production uh, tool, okay? And I've been using it for a couple different things. Uh, the primary use has been taking these so-so cameras that shoot 4K and downscaling to 1080. 
and it just it takes it's like a new camera so the gh4 um pretty much when i started playing with it and i recommend everyone else do the same thing don't even bother shooting at 1080 just shoot everything at 4k and downscale it to 1080 in post which is really easy to do um and you'll instantly get a great great image and that's one thing a lot of people um love about the canon cinema series cameras is it's actually a 4k sensor and it's it's um outputting at 1080 so they're like how is this so sharp and looks so fantastic well because it's it's kind of doing the downscaling in camera so right. that's how you're getting that fantastic sharp but not cheesy look and uh so you can do the same thing with a gh4 so that's one way i'm using 10 uh or i'm sorry 4k you can also do the the reframing which i know is kind of taboo among some circles <laughs> uh, but the thing is, depending on the thing you're, you're if you're doing a feature film, um, I wouldn't recommend using it to downscale and reframe. I would recommend shooting everything at 4K, just like you would 1080. So what you see is what you get framing wise. Right. That way, down the road, let's say, and it's not going to happen, but let's say in two years, 4K is everything. Everything's streaming 4K. Everything's broadcast 4K. You can just go back, pull up that file, and then re-export as 4K. But if you did all that reframing, you're kind of screwed because, you know, you'd have to completely re-edit that film. And uh, if you're shooting with the the mindset of I'm going to reframe, same thing. You're, you're kind of in big trouble. But for me, or if you're shooting a documentary or if you're shooting a web show, nobody cares. <laughs> most people are still <laughs> watching YouTube at maybe, you know, 1080, but most likely 720 and it's it's not a big deal. So so I'm fine with reframing. Obviously you can uh, stabilize, you can animate, you can do a lot of things with with 4K, which is really nice. Now aren't the file sizes pretty big though? That's the thing. Um, a lot of people, myself included, were terrified of 4K because first of all I'd have to buy a new machine to handle it, and a lot more you know storage, hard drive storage. But um, it comes back down to compression. So you look at the GH4, and you can shoot 4K, um, and the file sizes are actually comparable to like a 5D file sizes. So 10 minutes on a 5D and 10 minutes on a uh, GH4 at 4K, pretty much the same size. That's due to compression. And what's great, though, is even though you're, it's compressed, if you're downscaling, um, it makes up for it. So you're taking 4K, you know, roughly 4,000 pixels. You're dropping it into 1080, and it just gives you more flexibility. So what I love about the GH4 coming from Canon is on Canon stuff, you barely start to grade aggressively, and it just turns into mud. It just right. falls apart. On the GH4, if you're shooting 10K, or 10K, jeez, I'm mixing up 1080 and 4K. <laughs> if you're shooting 4K... 4K you have a lot of flexibility to, to really push um, your grade, which is awesome. So um, where was I going with that? Do you have flexibility with your files? Right, so file size. So let me just kind of reboot there. So that means you can, so that means you can take this, uh, this 4K image that has that lower bit rate and that, that compression and use it flexibly. So um, my machine is an iMac. I want to say it's like 2009, 2010. Actually, no, it's 2011. So it's, it's still a pretty old machine. And I'm able to edit 4K without any issues. Um, so that's that's really encouraging. And the file size isn't a big deal. So if, if you're concerned about that, it really comes down to compression. Um, so with, with the GH4, you just open you're that safe. with any, any video player? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quick looking... 4K takes um, from the GH4 in Finder on my Mac without issues. So, and that's the beauty of um, most NLEs is if you are having issues, you can still make it work. So every time I import something in a Final Cut 10, I create um, optimized media, which is transcoded media, and I create proxy media, which Final Cut will do as you import. And what that allows me to do is if it if my computer does start choking up or if I have two 4K streams, I just switch it to proxy. And um, it, it what it does, proxy essentially creates a smaller resolution uh, file. So you can still edit it seamlessly, but you're not working with the 4K original source. So often what I'll do is I'll edit in proxy, 
Then when it's ready, when it's time to, to grade or color correct the image, I'll switch it back to original or um, the transcoded files, and then I can see the actual sharpness and all this stuff. So um, that's another way to work around it. And I mean, you could you could work on a pretty slow machine and still still pull that off. Okay, now here's the question: 4K on a crop sensor or <laughs> 1080 on a full sensor? Uh, I don't care really, <laughs> honestly. It, it, I've I it was kind of a, a tough move to go from full frame to micro four thirds, but uh, you just kind of kind of rethink um, rethink how you think about sensors and lenses. Okay, so full frame, it's still outrageously amazing, right? It's fantastic. But uh, micro four thirds, you just re you just think about uh, getting faster glass. So you can't really get a 0.95 on a full frame, uh, but you can do that an f.95 on a micro four thirds. And with these Metabones adapters, you're getting up there with Super 35 or um, APS-C. So um, as for resolutions, man, I mean, obviously having a full frame camera with uh, 4K would be pretty fantastic. And uh, especially if we could get that in camera on a Sony, because what Sony, another thing I love about that Sony A7S is you can switch between full frame and APS-C. So, hmm. you know, without changing lenses, you can adjust that kind of that, that crop look um, or match it with another camera or whatever. You just have a lot of flexibility, which is pretty cool. Okay. I'm really, I feel bad for all our screenwriting people right now yeah. because they're like, they have no idea what we're talking about. So I have to apologize for that. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a little technical here. Um, so uh, let, let's uh, switch gears for a second sure. and talk about um, lenses. Now, if you're, let's say you've gone out and for a long time you're shooting on the uh, 5D or, or you were shooting with Nikon or whatever, and then you want, you're like, oh, well, I really want to try the... Uh, the GH4 out. Is there a way to have functioning lenses on these on other cameras, or are you kind of screwed? Oh yeah, the the GH4 or the Micro Four Thirds mount is one of the most flexible, if not the most flexible mount out there. Um, I just finished doing a lens course with um, a Viv from uh, Big League Cine Summit. I don't know if you heard yep. of them. Okay. No, I. Oh I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, that's right. I heard you, it. Well, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, in there, and I'm planning on doing a separate guide on this that people can check out. But in there, I talk about lens mounts and lenses. So uh, on the camera end and on the lens end, and what's compatible. So owning a, a, a Nikon camera is pretty rough because you pretty much are stuck with Nikon lenses and Nikon mounts. You can still use Sigma and stuff like that. But on the GH4, because it's a slightly smaller sensor, you can put anything on that thing. So, um, and in that course, I talk about adapter types. So you can just get a straight up mechanical adapter and take a uh, Canon mount or a Canon FD mount or a Nikon F mount lens and slap it on there for 15, 20 bucks. Um, or you can get one of these uh, speed booster lenses or adapters rather that kind of turn the the GH4 or Micro Four Thirds sensor into a crop sensor. So now your GH4 sensor size is roughly comparable to a 7D. Um, and that, that's what I've been using with Nikon lenses. So now I'm back to like roughly an APS-C sensor size. And um, so that's one way to go. Or you can get an electronic one like the Canon ones, which are, uh, I guess I want to say new, but they've been out for a couple months now. Um, so that way you could take your Canon glass and slap it on a GH4 and still, or a Sony A7S and uh, still be able to um, adjust aperture and all that good stuff. So several different options, but you're not really screwed. You have you have even more flexibility. So you can go out there and get really fun, crazy lenses that you couldn't use on, um, you know, a, a Canon sensor size. Now you could have autofocus and all that stuff too. Uh, yes and no. Um, you're not going to have this, you know, how Canon and some of their cameras, and this is one reason I still recommend some Canon DSLRs. They have that dual pixel autofocus system to mm -hmm. where it's, it, the autofocus is outrageous. So you're not going to get that kind of focus, but, you know, touch focus or, um, just half pressing the shutter to get focus. 
you're going to get that stuff. But for video, the autofocus isn't going to be terribly fantastic. Right. So you should stick with something from Panasonic if you want. Yeah. Do like a steady cam shot or something. Yeah. I mean, I would. St- oh yeah, yeah. If you if you want to do that, otherwise, you know, still manual. I just do everything manual still. So, um, that works. That works pretty well for me. Actually, one of my favorite parts of your presentation was talking about your favorite uh, cheap lenses. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> that you find. How, how did you find those lenses? Like you, you, you know, we we might list those later, but. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you find those or how do you go about finding like lenses on eBay that kind of, you know, are going to give you really great results, but they don't aren't they don't cost like the thousands of dollars sure. that like, the L lenses cost? Yeah. When I had a lot more time on my hand hands, I uh, again, it was that research thing. So um, I discovered that you could put, you know, vintage or older manual lenses with adapters onto your newer cameras. And that was a whole new world to me. Because uh, originally I was like, well, it's a Canon camera, so you put a Canon lens on it. Um, so once I discovered that, I really dug into that whole world. And there's a couple of videos on my website that are fairly old, but uh, they still um, talk about those different adapters and systems. And so it's just me researching a lot and then digging into just weird, deeper and deeper into, into different uh, lenses, these ancient vintage lenses that you could put on there. And... Um, uh, just a lot of research, and for a while, I would always, I would always have some kind of need, or I would need this kind of prime or this kind of zoom. And the big thing that was killing me, and that really started this, was I wanted a fast zoom, but I didn't want to spend 800 plus. Like to get a fast, solid zoom, it's a, it's got, it's going to be 800 or more for like an f2.8, nice range. Right. Um, so I was really digging in it, and that's where I discovered one of those lenses, which is that Nikon 35-70. to It's a 3.5 aperture at maximum uh, uh, aperture. So it's not 2.8, but it's con- it's, it's a, a constant aperture. So as you zoom right. in and out, you're still at 3.5. So um, then, then I just kept finding different things, and uh, that's what turned into that list was various lenses that I had bought – and was trying to save some some money and, and and they're not terrible lenses as I talked about in that that uh, class was these are these are pretty fantastic lenses you know the, the quality isn't matching the ridiculously low price <laughs> for some of right. those and you mentioned going on Ken Ruckwell's site too right and he's yeah that page yeah if you're looking at Nikon he does Canon stuff too but he has he has a lot of uh, I don't think I found that page I would just research a lens. And uh-huh. I would always check with him to see if he had talked about it because he he goes <laughs> yeah. into you know gross detail of everything. So yeah, that was my favorite find on his site was finding the the best cheapskate lenses. And I I went like the next day on eBay and started buying like 50 millimeter 1.8 Nikon AI or something. Right, right. And that's still one of my favorite lenses. If I just want to grab something and go out and just shoot and not really worry about losing my gear, I just right. take those out with me. <laughs> that's great. Now, um, I want to talk for a second about – well, let me ask you one more thing. What What is the major difference that you're – you know, a lot of people buy their camera and it comes with a kit lens. And, you know, obviously the, the um, aperture is different. But what is the, the main thing that you're getting when you buy one of these nicer lenses? I mean, what is – from somebody who shoots a lot, what do you see? Um, the build quality often, you know, especially if you're coming from kind of an 18 to 55 background. The build quality is going to be a lot higher, and uh, it's just going to function better all around. The, the zoom rings are nicer, and I'm saying all this with the Canon 24 to 105 as kind of its own category, because that's a great kit lens. But uh, the zoom rings are better. Uh, there's less funky breathing. They're just the, the kit lenses are built to be cheaper, right. and uh, just something to come along with your camera. So. Um, you know, you're just but do you get... think the f-stops are the major thing that give you that different look, like the the ability to shoot in f2.8 or even that's a big part know, of it. Yeah, or... it's not the yeah. whole picture, but that that is a larger larger part of it um, when you're looking at um, basic kit lenses that come with cameras versus buying a Canon 24 to 70 or or something like that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, now I want to focus on another topic that I don't ever hear anybody talking about, which is calibration and what your 
typical setup is when you when you're on set and you're setting up and you're you know putting together your um, uh, what is it EVF uh, you know like a monitor and trying to to you know make sure you, all your colors are right, right. and maybe working with a um, what do you call them a color sheet yeah or, or doing that can you explain that and how you calibrate that with what you have in post or like in what kind of software or whatever that you use for that? Sure. Yeah. I'm kind of coming up with a new workflow that has been working just awesome and it's pretty straightforward. So I'm trying to hunt down some of the resources online here. So uh, the the listeners can kind of check this stuff out. But the first thing we do um, after we light everything and get everything set up is I take this uh, data color card you can pick one up on B&H for like 50 bucks, I want to say. And um, it's just a simple card on one side. There's a large uh, middle gray. And then at the bottom, you have white through black with a gradation or uh, the various grays in between. And all I do is is uh, put that or, or use a white card or something white. Just use the same white everywhere. But we stick that roughly where the subject or um, the item that we're filming is going to be. Then I use uh, this iPhone app. Actually, I don't use a oh. I don't use a um, light meter. It's just an iPhone <laughs> app that is right. really accurate. Surprisingly, um, I want to say it's free or a couple bucks. Um, and I'll get all this stuff to you at the end, so you can throw it in, in show notes or something. Okay. Um, but yeah, I just put that right on the gray, and it gives me the color temperature because I'm not working with you know really expensive, all perfectly balanced daylight lights. Right. Um, and sometimes you, you mix some lights here and there. So I use mainly these uh, Alza 3000 high output LED lights. Um, they're kind of okay. like spotlights, so they're not the big panels. So, you know, those those have a plus or minus 1000 or 100 Kelvin difference in color temperature. So using okay. this app and sometimes we're forced to use natural light in a environment. So we were shooting at this crazy massive kitchen. There's all kinds of light in there and we got it mostly close. So then you uh, use the app, you put it right onto a white or that that gray, and it gives you a readout. So I'll take the readout and round up or down depending on where it's at, and it'll be you know 5420. So then I'll set the cameras to 5400 um, Kelvin in the camera. So now we have white balance. The next thing uh, we do is we pull up a waveform monitor, and waveforms really scare people. But there's a great video by um, Gary Jordan. Oh, what's his name? I always forget. Jordan, who's like the the Lord of all things Final Cut? Larry Jordan. Larry <laughs> Jordan. Larry, Larry Jordan. Jordan. Okay. Um, he has a great video where he talks about using scopes in Final Cut 10, and it's it, it, it he talks about scopes, so it's not just Final Cut 10. Okay. Um, but it, they're fantastic tools. So there's two scopes. There's the vector scope and the waveform monitor scope or waveform scope. The waveform okay. um, gives you exposure details. And then the vector scope gives you color information, very specific color information. So I can send you, I'll have the link for, for that video, which I recommend everyone check out. It'll completely change how you expose on set and check color and then how you grade and post. Okay. Perfect. So okay. we set up a waveform monitor, which um, for those you know that sometimes are confused, the the you know false color, when you hit that button on your monitor or on your camera and it shows you where exposure is by showing you different colors mm -hmm. across the screen, that is essentially a waveform monitor. It's just displaying the information in a different way. So what we do is once we have our white balance, like we talked about with the iPhone app, we use that gray card. And I pull up my waveform monitor and it shows me, you know, there will be all these crazy like mountain looking. It's kind of like a histogram, right? Right. And I'll see a perfect line somewhere. And that's where that gray card is because it's a one solid gray. There's no gradation or spikes. So then I get that to if you were shooting kind of on a standard setting, you'd want it around 50 because it's middle gray. Okay. And if you get that at 50 where your talent is sitting your exposure should be right on. Um, now, if you're shooting on a flatter profile, like uh, Canon Log or YDR or kind of a flat setting or picture profile on your DSLR, you're going to want to get that closer to 40 or 35 
and that's where your middle gray is. Okay, so um, you, everyone can experiment with this, but once you find where that lands and you import the footage and do some tests and figure out where your camera's uh, picture setting kind of lays, then you're done. Then everywhere you go, if you're using that picture style, you know to set that gray card to a certain level. And these waveform monitors and um, these false color settings um, and readouts on your camera or on a monitor they're all measured in IRE, which right now I can't remember exactly. Illuminance rendering something. Um, <laughs> so yeah, anyway, that's watch the video. Uh, Larry, Larry has <laughs> it all figured out. I'm still a noob, but uh, that's the idea. So we get the white balance, we stick that in there, we set our middle gray to for us it's around 40 on the C100s, and we're done. We know that's going to be perfect. Looking at the waveform monitor, we can also see if there's any spikes, so if we're blowing out somewhere or if our blacks are disappearing, and then we shoot. So um, that, that has been our workflow, and one other thing we'll do is if we're matching different cameras together, on the other side of that card, there's a bunch of different colors in little, little squares. We'll shoot that, and then in post, I will take the two different cameras with each having the same color chart, and I'll crop them so that I have both those color charts and I'll put them right next to each other. And then you can just instantly just blue with blue, red with red, and you can perfectly match those two cameras. Um, and if you have the other side of the card filmed as well, um, you'll have, uh, you know, the, the gray, black, and white. And it's just amazing how quickly you can match cameras up. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll shoot you an image when we're done of a... Uh, a little thing I did to make it a lot, a lot simpler and we're not frantically trying to find all this stuff. What I did is I took our slate and I taped, gaff taped the chart to the bottom of it. So for each take, um, you know, whoever was working slate would get in there, um, show the gray on the front, uh, you know, slap the slate and then turn it around and show the colors for a couple of seconds and then pull out. So that way every single take um, we had uh, the color information recorded so that we could right. come in later and um, match things up. This is really important if you're shooting in a lighting environment that's going to change. So if you're using natural light from a window and you're shooting for a couple hours, make sure you get that in there so that in post you can make sure contrast, color saturation, and color temperature can all be matched up uh, together. So that's chain. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but that those two things, checking white balance with that app on that gray card and then checking exposure on that gray card has been amazing. Otherwise, you know, a lot of us kind of use, use our eye to kind of figure it out or zebras, which, you know, can be a hit or miss and uh, don't show you everything. So, so uh, that's, that's been huge for us. Is there some sort of plug-in that you use to match them or you just do it by hand? Uh, you can do it by hand if, if you have, um, that's the one thing I don't like about Final Cut is there's not a clear like white balance color picker like there used to mm -hmm. be. Right. So um, there's there's plugins out there you can buy for like 40 bucks to do that or the best one is Colorista from uh, Red Giant and uh, they just released Colorista 3 and that has a nice little white balance uh, you can grab. But um, the beauty is now since we've been using the system uh, every time we pull the footage in the exposure is right on um the the white balance is killer so it's it's been a been a great system for us right now in terms of color grading when you actually want to put styles what what do you use for that i just use the built-in color tools with final cut um okay. i'm thinking about getting colorista 3 uh just because it gives me that traditional three wheels um final cut you can still adjust that stuff it's just kind of in a different layout so um, they have kind of a color spectrum system with three little little dots that you can move around versus the three traditional color wheels, which I kind of miss. Um, but Colorista fixes that. But yeah, I don't, I don't do too many crazy uh, plugins. I just kind of uh, stick with the basic principles of you know highlight, shadow, midtones, uh, mm. both for exposure and for color. And you can pretty much do anything with that. Um, unless you're looking for kind of a crazy stylized 
want to change grain and and do a lot of that stuff. But Final Cut's pretty pretty solid. You can also do a lot of matting, which is which is great. Now I was watching a video the other day. I think it was on No Film School, and it talked yeah. about the difference between like shooting raw and what the cinematographers actually saw versus what it looks like after you do all the grading. Do you do you actually shoot with without any sort of style as flat as you can and then do everything in post or do you do do you try to shoot it as close as possible to what the final is going to look like um we we're just kind of in the middle like i've never been a big fan of these wildly flat settings um especially on dslrs or cameras that are 8-bit have an 8-bit color space because what you're doing is a lot of the time you're removing saturation and 8-bit color you're barely hanging on to any information so when you suck all that out and record it when you try to put it back in post, it's just not going to look the same. <laughs> so you right. may have experienced this if you shoot standard or natural on a Canon DSLR, and then you shoot with one of these super flats and try to match it. You'll get it close, but it'll always look kind of wacky. It'll look a little, little, <laughs> little muddy and just weird. And that's because when you recorded, you recorded almost no color information. So when you try to pump color back in, it's it's just not there. So you're, you're fabricating, you know, fake, uh, information. Um, so in general, I'm kind of a natural guy, so I don't like the standard. Every camera has kind of a standard. If this was on your TV in a new studio, this is what it would look like. Very high contrast, high saturation. I like to work with natural, which usually is just a little more calm. So your saturation is still there and it's fine. You might bump it up a hair, remove something, but um, it's pretty close. And then contrast is kind of where I like it. Um, you know, not blacks are perfectly black and, and uh, everything's really crunchy. So with that, I can just barely tweak things in post. And, and I'm a believer in, you know, unless you're shooting some wild film where there's going to be a ton of special effects and a ton of um, grading work that needs done, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So for my show, obviously, I just want to get it out. So I'll I'll do just a couple tweaks, and even on documentary work or promotional work, we'll we'll shoot it where we can we have some room to play, but we're not we're not shooting you know super flat stuff or raw or anything like that. So depends on what you're shooting, but I, I just see, like to keep things flexible, but uh, not create work for ourselves. Okay, I've got one more section, and then uh, I've got the, I'll wrap it up. Awesome. <laughs> <'Cause I know. laughs> um, now talking about filmmaking and and uh, you know going on a set, can you talk a little bit about what the the most important things that you've kind of learned over the years in terms of the gear you absolutely need to have on set with you? What's the best way to kind of like how the day develops? You know how you set things up, what do you, what you want to have with you, how you light things, and just kind of an overview of of you know, shooting a shooting day. Yeah, um, I think the gear not isn't as important. Um, I, I was just talking to a guy. He sent me an email asking about what he needed to rent for a certain project, and um, that's the beauty of that C100 system is uh, just less is more. So one or two C100s, a, a light kit, a microphone, tripod, and you're done. <laughs> you know, and right. I'm really becoming that guy. Like I. I tell this to a lot of people, and um, I wish you, we could all instill this in, in people getting started. But we all—it's—it's it's like those the, that um, you know uh, those movies or stories where you try to go back in time and tell yourself or tell someone not to do something. They still right. do it, you know, because they don't—they <laughs> they still have that in them that they got to do it. So for right. gear, we all are like early on, we're like got to get this cage, got to get this, 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 this by a jib and all these things. And then later on, we're like, we have less cash. We have all this crap that we're not using and we <laughs> wish we had never done it. We wish we just yeah. spent that money on a C100, a good lens, good sticks, a light kit and a microphone, you know? Right. And, um, as you say that I'm sitting in a room full of equipment. Oh, me too. Use. Me too. I've got all kinds <laughs> of, you know, stuff in here. And, right. uh, it's, it's ridiculous. And so I'm, I'm trying to simplify at this point. And just, you know, a lot of these sets, you just have to bring the stuff because you never know when you're going to need it. So, um, so the gear, you know, it depends on the gig. But I will say um, there's a video I did. I want to say it's something like uh, 
five tips to being more become a more valuable assistant or filmmaker. Right. Yeah. Or become a more valuable filmmaker. And those are the kind of things that I really encourage people to focus on. So um, figuring if you work for one guy consistently, try to really understand what he needs before he needs it. Um, learn how to stage. So one of the first things that happens when you get on set, if you're not the director, um, often there's a small crew or something and the, whoever is the producer or director, they're just getting bombarded by the client or they need to calm the client down or talk to them about the script or all these things. So let them do that and, uh, stage everything. So even if you don't know how they want to light something, get all the C stands lined up, set up, get lights on stands, coil up the cords and hang them on the light. So when he's like, okay, let's put the key here, let's do this, you're not pulling everything out of the bags, you're grabbing a light and plugging it in and turning it on. Um, set cameras up and just stage that. So when I go into a space when we film, first thing we do is see where we're going to be filming and then look around for a good staging area. So if that's a room next door or in the same room, there's a blank wall somewhere that there's not a lot of traffic, you can set all this, the cases and bags up over there. And, um, that can just be a huge thing to help, help out. And then the other thing is just constantly being on. So, um, don't kind of check out at some point. I know it can be a really long day if it's interviews where you're just, you're dying. You know, there's someone talking about something you're not really interested in and you're behind the camera, but it's really important, um, to really stay attentive. So just constantly monitor, come up with a system where, you know, every 30 seconds or a minute, you check to make sure the red light is blinking. You check your audio levels. <laughs> you listen. Yeah. You make sure the fan didn't kick on. You look around the room, make sure all the lights that have batteries are still on because sometimes those right. will tick off. And just have some a constantly running checklist. That make and first of all, you'll you won't miss anything, and that can be huge, huge, huge because it's so messed up or it's so bad when like a background light dies. And it's at a crucial right. moment in the interview, and the director's not didn't notice it. So that makes you very valuable to them. And all this stuff is for you to be just a better filmmaker in general. And it's also so that um, you know you keep getting hired, <laughs> and you keep right. getting asked to come back on set. So um, those are the kind of things that uh, that are, are really important and um, can make you incredibly invaluable. Yeah, that, that reminds me, I used to, you know, a million years ago, I used to do video uh, deposition videos. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was like, I would have to, like, I would catch myself, like, drifting off yeah. and falling asleep because it was just so, I mean, we'd be there for hours and hours. And, you know, I, I remember just having a panic attacks that I would, like, fall asleep and the light would go off in the middle of some really important testimony. Or yeah. Something. <laughs> um, so... Do you uh, do you have any plans for like feature filmmaking or anything like that? Um, I I'm I've thought about it and I think when I have some of these other projects finished, I might pursue something like that. I have a couple ideas for things, um, but uh, there's just a lot. Like I, I I consider myself a film, filmmaker, but I'm also a hardcore podcaster. So right. doing these video podcasts and training. Um, so I have some things I like to do. Um, I'm just waiting for the right time and you know everybody says this and i am a believer in just make the film <laughs> right but yeah. you know when you have you done any shorts or anything uh yeah mo most my main passion is documentary um, right okay and it used to bore the snot out of me but there's so many great <laughs> stories out there oh, and yeah. there's some really cool stuff that you can uh you can you can cover and tell that story so i've really gotten into um various ideas and concepts and you know my at the end of the day my my passion is uh, helping people just take that first step and find solutions to problems with filmmaking. Right. So for a long time, it's been gear like this whole, most of what we've talked about today is gear, but my real passion is that tutorial stuff. So, you know, um, for, stop worrying about what kit you need to buy and, and think about, you know, how to master cinematography or take that first step. So I'd love to do a documentary on, um, something to do with overcoming, uh, that, that everyone's an aspiring something. So quit, mm -hmm. knock that off, like quit calling yourself aspiring and aspiring and actually do it. So, um, interviewing people talking about how they got started. And the hardest thing is that just that first step, 
So if you do have that film or that script or whatever you've been thinking about, figure out what that very first step is and knock it out and then figure out what the next step is and just keep plodding away. So if you have a documentary, you know, if you haven't written it, start writing. If you've already written something and you're hemming and hawing about filming, get on the phone, find some friends, um, and, uh, start just knocking little things out and take it from this behemoth monster of a project and just start nibbling away at it and, uh, knock it out. So that's a long answer to that question, but, (laughs) but I have, I have a lot of stuff that I'm really enjoying and very passionate about right now that are smaller projects. And, uh, I don't want to necessarily become the next Shane Hurlbut. Um, I think you really have to be built to do that. I mean, that guy, um, for those who don't know, he's a cinematographer. He does a fantastic job, but I was at one of his, uh, recent tours here in Chicago and oh, yeah, he's yeah. gone I was gonna for, ask you yeah, that. yeah, it was fantastic. But at the end of the day, we asked him, you know, so how, someone asked him, how do you balance all this? And he's like, there's no balance. You know, <laughs> there is, there really, and it, he got kind of right. sad and it was really touching and emotional because, you know, his, he says his wife is a single mother. Like he spends wow. eight plus months out of the year working somewhere yeah. else. So I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't think I can handle that. So, um, right. I don't want to be a, a full-time cinematographer. Um, I respect that, and I think that's awesome for those that are built to handle that. But, uh, you know, just coming back to the, the what everybody says, it's all about story and just whatever that means to you. If that's shorts, that's great. Kind of, I'm a big Shane Hurlbut fan. Sure. So what what were the top takeaways that you got from the uh, the Illumination experience, I assume, is what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um Oh man, it's it's so much good stuff. A lot of lighting. Because there's a lot of stuff online. Yeah, that yeah. he kind of puts out there. But but what what are some what are the secrets so people don't have to pay for that? Sure. <laughs> like me, like what are the big things that you that kind of blew you away about his uh, presentation or the, I, the class? I think one of the big takeaways was um, each one of his films, and you can kind of see this when you watch his movies that he's done. He never does a movie that it's the same kind of thing. So he only does projects that there's something new involved, um, which I think is, is, is cool. And the, he walked through his entire process for how he treats a film. He kind of covers this on his blog, but he went into real depth of um, spending months and months putting together uh, a treatment uh, or, or getting one quickly to them so he gets, he gets uh, the gig and then really digging into what does this film mean, what is the emotion behind each character, and looking at photographs, looking at um, kind of the feel he wants. So he talks about color, talks about... Um, did you see the presentation he did at Cine Summit? No, no, I missed that. Did he get it into was, some of that? Because he went, he went through um, Crazy Beautiful and talked yep. about how he put that scene yeah, together yeah. So and how he, the one side and the line between them and then like one side was disorganized and one side was like... He went through that whole scene. Yeah, that's pretty much what he, he did that too. Um, he covered this crazy, um, this thing he does for every film and every character in every film that he does, and it's called uh, the light study. So I don't know if you talked about that, but no. he has this massive, crazy rig that goes in a circle, and he puts each of the actors right in the middle and goes around them with the light. And what he'll notice is certain angles that they're lit from completely changes their face and sometimes with a certain angle it it if it's a historical thing he'll be like whoa whoa, stop right there like that's how we're gonna light him for the whole movie because he looks (laughs) like the actual guy and right so he'll just experiment and some some people the way their face is built it um it just doesn't work from certain angles so he'll document all that for each character and then as they go through filming the actual film they know exactly, you know, how to treat certain uh, actors and their features with light, which is really interesting. He also went into, you know, um, one other big thing that people should experiment with is, you know, how we put the hair light opposite of the key. Mm-hmm. So if you're facing the talent and you light them from the right in the back, hitting them in the back of the head, it would be on the left. You'd have your your hair light. Um he actually lights everything from the same side. So he's got the key on the right and the hair light on the right. Um, hmm. 
and uh, it's kind of interesting. And what he does to kind of counter that, because usually we want to remove them from the background a little bit, he'll use the on the side that there's no light, he'll put a background light on some furniture in the background to kind of separate that. And it was interesting seeing how he went about that and kind of rethinking that tr typical three-point lighting stuff. Right. So. Okay, my final two segments, and we're out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Because I'm trying to. Sp I know you've been uh, you've been with me for a, uh, an hour and twenty minutes now, so I'm I'm trying to respect your time. No worries. <laughs> uh, we have two final segments. One's called the time machine. Um, and I eventually plan on having some sound effects go with this and a whole intro, but for now it's just nice. called the time machine. And the idea is what would you, if you could go back in time and talk to, I don't know, 18 year old Caleb Pike or 14 year old, whatever younger version. Cause you're younger than I am. Mm. Um, what, uh, what advice would you have for yourself and what, what would you tell yourself? Yeah, I would definitely do the whole, it's not about the gear speech. <laughs> yeah, and, we already uh, touched on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, man, uh, I think one thing I've always struggled with is, and I'm sure everyone else can relate to this, is um, we have certain quality standards for ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's a video out there by somebody famous that I can't remember, and it was an interview, and he talked about how most of us have good taste. You know, we watch a movie, we, we like it and we know why we like it, but when we produce our own work, we just can't, we can't get it to that level. So you ever have that where you, where you shoot a short film or something and you know, it's good and you did it, but it's just not what you maybe imagined or, yep. um, every time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. And, right. and, and that's, that's not a bad thing you know, because you're not lying to yourself and you're not someone with horrible taste. We're like, this is the best thing ever. And it's terrible. You know, you, that's a good place to be. And, um, just understanding that you're just going to be working. The more you create the closer or the smaller that gap is going to be between where you are, what you can produce and what your taste is. Right. So, um, maybe if you, if you don't have that, if you don't see you know, if you feel like everything that you make is fantastic, maybe look into that a little more and, um, and don't be afraid to just get stuff out there and be humble about it. You know, I put stuff up all the time where I'm wrong with a video or, you know, there's, I mean, it's going to be scary when I have kids and get older and look back at all these terrible videos I did, but <laughs> just get it out there. So I did a music video recently that I'm not really proud of at all. I mean, there's some things I liked. Um, right. it was a tight budget and tight timeline but you know just so someone on there was like wow this kale this is really bad and like you know <laughs> just just be like you know what and i th that's where it kind of broke me and i was like yeah, yeah it's not here's why i don't like it and i've got some room to go and just get real right. with yourself and other people and that's okay um we don't have to produce everything perfectly and that that also stops us from even getting anything done so i'm working on this gh4 guide and i started it last summer um, shouldn't be taking this long, but I would always be like, ah, oh, well, you know, it's winter time and everything looks like garbage outside and blah, blah, blah. You know, just, there's a book that I listened to on audible called the obstacle is the way. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could go back in time and just give that book to myself from the future, that would be awesome because it, it just, it's just sit down, realize where you are, realize, yes, I have limitations. Yes. I can't do this, this, and this. Yes. I don't have the money for this and that but we're going to do this and we're going to get around it. So instead of trying to push this boulder out of the way, just get a ladder and go over it, you know? All right. So with a GH4 guide or with a film that someone might be working on, instead of trying to secure that perfect location or that actor, you know, realize you have that limitation and it's impossible, but there's another way around it and just get her, get her done. <laughs> okay. Um, and my, the last question I have is, uh, the segment I'm thinking about calling it film school, it's still kind of in the works. But um, can you can you give something that filmmakers can go out right now, and whether it's uh, a film that's influenced you, a book that's influenced you? Um, you already mentioned a book, so that's kind sure. of cheating. Um, but what what a, what's something that has really uh, affected you, whether it's a movie, a video, whatever? Oh man. 
<laughs> I always I shouldn't have saved it for the last one. I know, right? I always uh, <laughs> blank on like movies that have. Um, does it have to be a book? Can it be like a concept? No, anything. Oh, okay. anything you want. Uh, there's something that I love this because no matter where you are um, on the skill level scale. Um, you can work on this, and especially if you're getting started. And the beauty of this is you can get the cheapest camera out there and start learning, and that is framing. Um, it seems like the most basic of things, but um, if you just just take whatever camera you can get your hands on, even if it's your iPhone, and just, just really master framing. So um, if you don't already understand headroom, uh, you know, uh, nose room, so if someone's walking through a scene, you don't want, you know, you want to have lots of space in front of them. That's nose room. And then headroom, knowing when you can change headroom. So when you're filming someone bald, you might crop in on a tight and bring crop it <laughs> lower than you would um, right. so that, you know, it can look weird. Just really dig into framing. And there's really no cost involved with that. And, uh, you know, understand how framing uh, works with people or with objects. Um, how can you try practicing making a shot incredibly uncomfortable? So breaking the rules, you know, if you had a scene where you wanted, you wanted the audience just to be like crawling, you know, they're, they're, it's very awkward. How would you frame that? And, um, I think that's, that's a, it's great cause there's really no cost involved and you can, uh, get that under your belt moving forward. And, uh, so when you do show up on a scene, you know, exactly which lens, which camera, or where the camera height is, the angle, all that stuff. So that's that's a great place to to get some cheap education. Do you have any favorite filmmakers? Not maybe not films in particular, but people that you really have influenced you? <sighs> Everybody. I mean, I <laughs> okay. I, I, won't, I won't keep digging. Yeah, I, I'm not. You know, there's so many. There's so many good people out Just there. Just all the greatest filmmakers learn everything they have to. Yeah, I mean, I really dig you. Christopher Nolan um, recently. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how people can get in touch with you and, and find you online? Sure. Um, the main places is obviously the website DSLR Video Shooter. Oh, DSLR Video Shooter dot com. And um, I'm on Twitter. I love Twitter. So uh, at Caleb Pike, C-A-L-E-B-P-I-K-E, all one word. And then uh, we've got a pretty wild Facebook page. So facebook.com slash DSLR video shooter. And that's where me and the, the crazies are usually hanging out. <laughs> all right, man. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Caleb. No problem. Thanks for having me on, Jason. All right. I want to thank our guest, Caleb Pike of DSLR video shooter.com. Um, don't forget, if you like the podcast, subscribe and leave a review and get in touch with us on Twitter if you want or Facebook or Pinterest. Actually, I mean, Pinterest is one of my favorite new places to just pick up some you know, random tips and find articles. If you're a really visual person, then you should definitely be on Pinterest and just do a search for uh, filmmaking. Or if you're a screenwriter, do a search on screenwriting. And you can also kind of connect with people on there. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of screen uh, of Pinterest these days. All right, guys, thanks a lot. And we'll uh, see you on the next episode next Tuesday. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. Film Academy Podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com.